right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the Business Immigration to the US Current and Future Trained webinar hosted by Global Detroit and Foucault Immigration. Uh, my name is Gui Chu Wang. I'm the program manager for Global Talent at Global Detroit. At Global Detroit, we develop and implement inclusive strategies to drive the growth of Detroit and Southeast Michigan. Through our Global Talent Retention Initiative, we help Michigan companies hire, hire highly skilled talent by connecting them with international students from Michigan universities. Today, we're very honored to have our long-standing supporters and partners Rami Fukori, Managing Director of Fukori Global Immigration, and Karen Filippi, Director of, of, of the Office of Global Michigan to join us and explore significant shifts in business immigration policies in the past two years. Rami and Karen will also provide insights into developing businesses immigration trends in 2022. Uh, today's webinar will be about a one hour long. You are welcome to put your questions in the chat area. Uh, because of the time constraint, we probably will not be able to answer all the questions, but we will stop from time to time to, and pick some questions to answer. Uh, today's webinar will also be recorded, and the recording will be shared with people who registered for the event, together with a PowerPoint we developed for the event. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot to cover, so it's not, uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Karen and Rami to start the webinar. Thank you. Uh, great to see everybody. As Guicho mentioned, I'm Karen Phillippe, Director of New American Integration for the Office of Global Michigan. We're a state-level office supporting immigrant and refugee integration, and I'm also um, very proud to serve as board chair for Global Detroit. Um, I look forward to this conversation with Rami today um, that, again, is really focused on employment-based immigration um, for our business community. Um, and we'll dive right in. Um, we do have a, a series of questions for Rami and you know, we'll be discussing. And then um, just for ever, the those who are listening in, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Those will be monitored uh, by Quicho uh, and Kinsey from Global Detroit. And at the end of each section, um, at the end of each question that, that we go through with Rami, um, we'll answer some questions from folks if you have any. So uh, without further ado, uh, Rami, um, good to see you, first of all, as always. Um, what is happening in the job market today, especially around the need for talent um, in high-skilled STEM fields specifically? Uh, sure, Karen. Of course, everyone's heard the uh, term, the, the great resignation, uh, perhaps triggered most likely by the pandemic. Uh, but within the great resignation, you know, even prior to the pandemic, we, we basically have approximately 10,000 people a day retiring. Uh, the baby boomers have started retiring about two years ago. So we're looking at approximately 60 million people leaving the workforce in the next 15 plus years. And so um, the pandemic clearly accelerated and uh, created a, a definitely an incredible short-term gap, and not just in the U.S., worldwide, uh, for workers in all levels. Uh, but I know we're focusing more or less on skilled workers, our professionals here. So um, with that said, um, it just the, recently the Federal Reserve, I think just yesterday, stated that um, part of the reason for inflation today is the lack of knowledge workers. And uh, immigration would be a, one good solution and an immediate solution, uh, short-term solution for the shortage of professional workers. Um, so with that said, uh, for IT specifically, there are currently 1.5 million vacancies in computer science related um, occupations. Uh, to exacerbate that further with all of the trade tensions, et cetera, uh, and the reshoring of a lot of uh, advanced manufacturing and even chip manufacturing and design, et cetera, uh, we're gonna have even a more profound need for knowledge workers. Um, so we have an incredible gap. We have a perfect storm that uh, is sort of happening right in front of us in terms of the number of uh, vacancies, uh, which is driving up costs, uh, preventing us from adopting to new technologies, um, creating um, uh, sort of shortages where corporations are not able to fulfill their growth ability. And it's impacting the US economy, our growth rates and everything else. Um, so, um, and what I find very troubling about all this is the fact that there are other destinations with very friendly or progressive immigration policies uh, for IT workers, such as the UK, Canada, uh, Australia, and um, and people have choices now. And um, and a lot of these companies are really, even countries like Chile, 
are really trying to facilitate the movement of talent and brains to their countries. And as we all know, that uh, corporations will go to where they can find talent. And um, so I'm very concerned about the long-term impact, even though we are all talking about the short-term uh, ramifications of the pandemic right now. So um, I do also want to mention that uh, in, in all of this, our death rate and our birth rates uh, essentially cancel one another. And so we're not growing naturally uh, in the United States. And most of the developed world is the same way. Um, so I believe for many reasons, uh, of course, employment and taking on um, a lot of these jobs in IT, but also too, I want to mention healthcare. Uh, for instance, there are a projected shortage of 120 plus thousand physicians, 1.5 million nurses um, in the next 10 years. So it's not just IT. Um, a lot of the, um, the uh, careers that require advanced education are also under threat. And my concern, and I've already heard some of this, is the fact that corporations are saying, well, if we can't really operate and find talent in America, well, we'll just uh, base our operations elsewhere. We'll get the work done somewhere else, which is becoming easier and easier um, as technology unfolds and as people get used to a virtual world. So I do feel that this is not only an economic issue, it's a national security issue for the United States. Um, so we do need to make sure that we have a strong pipeline of well-educated people who tend to be entrepreneurial, who tend to um, take on risks and are very innovative. If you look at some of the greatest companies that we have right now, just within the last 15, 20 years, from Google to Apple uh, to even Zoom, most recently, um, these are people that were immigrants or children of immigrants. And so, uh, so if these people had not migrated to the United States, uh, where would we be? Where would they have started up in another country? So we have to be very cognizant that um, America is still generally the, the preferred place to, to work and live. Um, however, we do have competition and, uh, and we need to take that seriously. And as such, we really need to modernize a really outdated immigration system to help our corporations, our cities, our communities to gain the knowledge workers that we need to not only um, continue to, to thrive, but stay in the lead in terms of leading technology, which I feel is in everyone's interest. And I think, Rami, that um, this first question about you know, that the, the job market and the need for STEM talent really dovetails well into our second question about why is immigration important to the U.S. economy? Sure. Actually, I think it's one of the major factors of why the U.S. is so great. Um, I, you know, we are a nation of immigrants, right? I mean, what are we, 243 years old? And um, basically everyone is from somewhere other than, uh, of course, the uh, native Indian population. Um, so I, I do feel that it's in our DNA from the very beginning of this country, even with Alexander Hamilton, who had a profound impact on the way this country was designed. So um, with that said, um, I think immigration, again, um, has more or less allowed the United States to foster diversity, um, uh, creativity. And these are not my words. These are words of people like Ronald Reagan and others in the past that had a very pro-immigration uh, position. Um, but they add so much to our uh, community and to our workforce. I believe over one third of our software developers are foreign nationals or immigrants, I should say, I'm sorry. Um, you, approximately 30% of our physicians are. Um, we have many in uh, the financial sector and trades and other areas. A lot of our entrepreneurs from small businesses, restaurants or service businesses to the utmost complex um, software companies such as Zoom, as I mentioned earlier, uh, are immigrants. And uh, even the uh, head of Microsoft today uh, came in on an H-1B and was an immigrant, uh, actually a non-immigrant at one point turned to an immigrant. So I, I do feel that they played a vast a role in the development of the United States, in our economy, in creating these incredible companies that have taken the lead in the world and continue to create more jobs, which creates tax revenue, builds communities, uh, has many spillover effects in terms of creating indirect jobs in the service industries, restaurants and other communities, uh, they, they own property. So overall, I think it's a, it's a very good thing. And uh, we do have room in the United States for more immigrants. Uh, as stated in the previous question, um, again, we have to look at, a, a, we're almost a declining population. And um, if you look at the future of Social Security, Medicare, uh, with 60 million people retiring in the next 15 to 20 years, and that's been accelerated, by the way, due to the pandemic, um, who's going to pay into our, our systems in terms of Social Security, Medicare? Who's going to take on these jobs? And if they're 
for, for unable to do it here in America, where will they go? Now, again, I mentioned to our friendly neighbor to the north, they have a very progressive immigration policy. They're trying to bring in about a million people a year, a country of 38 million people. So it, actually, I believe last year it even surpassed the United States. So I think we have to, as a nation, whether you're on the right or the left, make a decision on what's the net benefit of bringing in immigrants. And I think what happens is a lot of times this notion of uh, immigrants take away jobs from locals or prevent locals from having an opportunity. But as we see, we already have an unemployment rate of less than 4%. And if you look at the, the knowledge-based um, occupations, in many cases, less than 2%. Uh, again, with so many people leaving the workforce uh, due to retirement or otherwise, um, and due to the fact that we are actually in, our, in the fourth industrial revolution, where we require new skill sets, new education, a new way of thinking, uh, it's very critical that we um, make sure that we harbor the talent necessary so that we can hold on to these strategic industries and technologies that will further allow the United States to, to not only benefit, but again, to thrive in a and a very fierce global market for talent. Um, uh, I've read one study, and I, I don't recall, it's an international global study that the projected shortage, or I'm sorry, projected workforce in the IT computer science industry in 20 years is something in the neighborhood of 80 million people. Uh, we're talking about a $3.7 trillion industry that's growing at five or 6% a year, and the median wage is $100,000 a year. So it's uh, now you can see why other countries have sort of um, you know, woken up and have realized that, you know, this is an incredible industry and it touches every other uh, facet of life and uh, every other business and that it's critical that they have a very strong infrastructure in computer science and engineering. Um, and I think, again, as we look at the, um, the reshoring opportunity, it was even occurring prior to the pandemic, but it has been accelerated, I believe, by the pandemic, where hopefully the United States plays a much bigger role in redesigning of chips and, um, and even manufacturing battery technology for EV vehicles, et cetera, um, that we need the workers here. I mean, no company is gonna make substantial investments if they don't have the people to execute it. And um, so I, as, as stated, I mean to be redundant here, but um, you know, countries like Canada are trying to capture this, uh, this area, even New Zealand is. Um, you look at the corridor of Toronto and Waterloo, and they're creating a tremendous number of jobs every year. And, um, and, th and that's wonderful. I think there's plenty for everyone, but we cannot lose sight of it. And this is sort of a self-destruction. I, I, I don't understand why we don't um, have a more thoughtful and strategic policy of allowing knowledge workers or even uh, just our students, the number of students um, that study in the, in the United States, uh, allow them a better pathway of staying here. So with that said, uh, to the credit of the Biden administration, um, they just expanded the STEM fields for the O-1 visa. They've uh, basically been able to uh, make a few things a little easier to make the United States more of an attractive destination. So immigration is critical to the United States. And my concern is we don't want to um, have people hesitate about considering the United States as a destination or if their students are staying here due to archaic and just outdated immigration policies that make no sense in today's world. Yeah, to that point, um, and I know you mentioned this, Rami, you know, in terms of, you know, the job creation side, um, and I know a number of us um, have talked about this before, um, you know, when you think just about international students themselves, um, you know, the international students not only contribute to the um, economic well-being of the university itself, but the whole region around it. So, you know, the housing, the automobile market, the uh, restaurants, the retail shops, et cetera, the, the, um, the cities and, and localities that have those international students, um, you know, really their, their economy does see uh, a greater impact. Um, and, you know, and the other really important piece um, that I know you touched upon a little bit too, Rami, is, you know, here in Michigan and in many other states, but for immigration, we would have had much more significant population loss. Um, and so, you know, the um, in terms of immigration being important to the U.S. economy, right there, it's that cyclical piece of if we don't have the people to fill the jobs and and, um, you know, there's there's concern there. But then there's also all those other ripple effects that happen if you know, an employer say can't find its, um, you know, enough individuals to um, fulfill its workforce, it may send people overseas. I know we've experienced that, um, 
you know, here in Michigan, again, as well with individuals who or companies who may not have been successful in um, having someone, uh, quote unquote, win the H-1B lottery, and they've sent entire divisions of their companies overseas because they were able to get visas for people to work overseas when they couldn't get them here in the U.S., um, you know, there's just, I know this question in particular could be a topic for this, you know, on its own of an entire hour of why immigration is important to the U.S. economy. And um, I think those of us participating in here, listening in are, are all well aware. Um, do we have any questions yet, Guijo, in terms of um, the, um, what's been provided so far? Uh, not yet. Yeah. So I'm sure there's like a, um, people brainstorming questions. So feel free to put your question in the chat area. We'll be coming back to them. Um, and I, Karen, if I could just, uh, just add to what you just mentioned, um, just in terms of Michigan, um, the, the estimated uh, spending power of Im the immigrant community is $20 billion. And uh, as a result, uh, $7.8 billion are paid in taxes. And this is in 2019. Uh, Southeastern Michigan alone is at $12 billion. So you can see how much of an impact that has um, on, you know, just funding our infrastructure, our healthcare, et cetera. So um, I, I think that there's um, just ample studies um, that, that demonstrate that an immigrant population uh, in the, you know, that knowledge or a you know, highly educated sector is absolutely critical for these communities and for rebuilding. Um, so um, again, it's, it's a natural uh, market, um, tool that really doesn't hurt the taxpayer or citizen in any way and only adds a tremendous amount of value. So, um, and, and again, something like one third of all entrepreneurs tend to be immigrants as well. So, so I, I do feel, and they end up creating jobs, I do feel it's really um, not even an argument or a discussion. Um, I, I'm being a little dramatic, but I, you know, unfortunately we do have forces that tend to feel that uh, it's a negative impact and it's not by any measure. And again, if we just look at other countries and you know, they study these things, they're pretty smart people. Um, they have policies that will further support the notion of bringing in not only foreign students, but also trying to retain foreign students. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe in the country of Canada, um, if you are a foreign student and you complete a four-year degree uh, in STEM, that they will pay you back your tuition as long as you stay there. In Germany, you basically get residency. Uh, these are far more liberal policies than what we have. And, um, you know, and there's a good reason for it, um, you know. So I, I do feel that um, the, uh, the review uh, of our policies to update our immigration laws will have an immediate and direct impact on Southeastern Michigan, Michigan and the United States. And we really need to do it because otherwise we will lose entire sectors or you know, companies that will move divisions. Um, add in to all of this, the fact that you can work anytime, not only anytime, the new term is anywhere. So you may even now have U.S. citizens that will want to live and work somewhere else, uh, maybe doing work for U.S. corporation. And um, the borders are, um, how do I say this politically, uh, when it comes to knowledge workers are not as critical. And so the work will get done one way or the other. It's creating that talent pool that's here that can help facilitate keeping the jobs here, creating the jobs here, and, and making sure that we um, grow our economy and keep the tax revenues in the United States. So. I have a couple of questions. Um, sure. Betsy, I'm going to ask yours first. And Betsy, if I don't phrase it correctly, please um, feel free to unmute and, and jump on if I if I don't say this one correctly. But um, so Rami, you know, as we all know, or I think most folks know, recently the Biden administration expanded um, the um, STEM degrees uh, allowable with 22 uh, new ones included that will help more international students stay for up to that three year period. But is there any change in the ability to apply for H-1B that will follow for allowing them to stay long-term? Um, unfortunately, the H-1B um, category has a numerical limit. Um, the Biden administration has um, more or less um, stopped uh, some of the more um, drastic um, regulatory measures to prohibit or make it more difficult to attain H-1B status in the United States. Um, they will be proposing new legislation. I don't know how far that go, or maybe they'll do it regulatorily, um, where, whereby uh, they will look at wages. And of course, protecting US workers is very critical. 
Um, but um, unfortunately, without an act of Congress, it's really difficult to expand the H-1B program. However, they have been able to allow, for instance, H-4 with spouses of H-1Bs or L-2s or others, their, their for spouses to more or less be able to work. And that really came as a result of a lawsuit that ultimately USCIS had agreed to. So it does expand the number of professional workers, or I should say at least workers, um, a bit. But unfortunately, with the H-1B, um, we are sort of categorically limited in what we can, what we can do and who we can bring in. Um, there is new legislation, which I'm, I'm afraid is not going to really act, the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021, um, that would basically exempt, um, you know, more master's degrees, PhDs, even from the green card process numbers. But um, we are in the lottery system. I believe that uh, for every H-1B candidate that's interested in uh, being in pursuing one or a corporation or pursuing one for individuals, one out of three end up getting approved. And uh, that's, a, that's a real shame. Um, so the demand is, is there. And even during the pandemic and even during uh, downturns, again, we are living in an era of severe shortages in IT. And so um, approximately two thirds of all the H-1Bs end up going to IT workers. The rest are distributed to healthcare and others. So with that said, um, uh, the expansion of the uh, O-1 visa uh, for STEM fields, et cetera, which just literally happened, I believe, last week, uh, is a very positive development and will allow more people to stay, especially people probably with master's degrees or PhDs in STEM fields, and uh, hopefully that will add numbers. But, but again, the numbers are really trivial. If you think about a workforce of 125 million, we're, we're, what are we talking about? Not even 10, 20,000 additional probably um, visas will ultimately be approved, but right. better than nothing, I suppose. Yeah. So I know we've got a couple more questions in the chat. I'm going to do one more and then we will, I will, we, I've kept track of the questions that have come in and we'll get back to those as we have time. But, um, Rami, what do we think is the most impactful legislation required to serve as the tipping point either here, um, in Michigan or nationally for immigration? And, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, go out on a limb, Jim, and take a little liberties with your question and say either legislation that's being considered, or I would even argue legislation that we think should be written. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I actually, I really uh, do like, and it's not a perfect bill, and it, it's based on compromise, and it's long overdue, it should have been done 15 years ago, is, uh, you know, the proposed legislation um, uh, that, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to really move due to the partisanship and the political gridlock at the moment. Uh, but basically, um, this um, piece of legislation, the U.S. Act of uh, U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021, will basically exempt PhDs in STEM fields from green cards. It'll lift the numerical limits for for the priority dates because uh, we have you know literally hundreds of thousands of people waiting to obtain their their green cards because of the priority date situation. Uh, it'll modernize our entire system. It even allows for. Um, what they call the Heartland Visa, which is something I believe uh, Steve, Karen, and I worked on a long time ago, um, that is very similar to the Detroit Visa, where a, basically a lot of the Rust Belt cities and counties will have the ability to, um, to seek talent and to petition for individuals that will be critical to the local economy, which I think is a phenomenal idea, because uh, we do have, unfortunately, um, economic decay. And I, I believe that uh, an incredible strategy would be, it would be to bring in very well-educated, talented people and allow them to rebuild these communities and attract more businesses and more people to those communities. And ultimately, everyone's better off. So I do, I'm a big advocate of the new legislation. Um, however, politically, I just don't see it moving forward. I hope I'm wrong. Um, yeah. And definitely, I think it's probably a bit too late and we'll see what happens during the midterms, but um, I, I don't see immigration moving forward, which is really a shame because I think both Democrats and Republicans um, starting Clinton made some significant changes, but then it really stopped uh, President Bush, a Republican tried. Um, I know President Obama had tried uh, not much under uh, President Trump. He had some some decent ideas in terms of employment, immigration, but again, even that it just did not move forward. So we seem you know, to be in a very stranglehold here that we just can't seem to break out of, regardless yeah. of who's in the White House. Do you know who the sponsor is for that bill, Rami, for the U.S. Citizenship Act? I, I think it's a Senator Mendez, if I'm not mistaken, of New Jersey. Okay. I think he's the okay. primary author of that. And it's, it's a very well-thought-out yeah. bill. It makes and it definitely, yeah, and immigration legislation, as you know, has just been 
difficult for a couple of decades now, really, um, to get anything that's meaningful passed. Okay. Um, but thinking about where we are in business immigration right now, um, how did the prior um, administration, um, the prior presidency impact business immigration? Oh, boy, where do I start? Um, well, for the for one thing, I think there are a lot of um, um, memos, executive orders, and otherwise that really had a chilling effect on immigrants and uh, our approach to immigration. Um, I think the um, the administration, not to get into the minutia of it all, tried to redefine certain things like employer, employee employer um, relationship. Um, I think that they are looking at changing um, a lottery system, and and there's some legitimacy to looking at wages, and that should be part of it. I think the Biden administration is going to incorporate that as well uh, for H-1Bs. Um, the fact that uh, employment authorization cards are one year versus now, thank God, with Biden uh, moved on to two years. So in other words, I think they just tried to make it very costly and difficult uh, for employers and for foreign nationals to remain in the United States, uh, despite the fact that they claimed that they were looking for people that were uh, well-educated and talented and uh, but the actions were otherwise. Um, the other thing too is that they added a uh, ability to um, to support uh, more or less and that, like an affidavit for professional workers um, that would basically they'd ask you for a lot of financial information that really was meaningless because most of these people were at six figures or more and um, many of them had professional spouses and uh, it was really just a waste of government time and money and it just exacerbated. The, the entire problem of trying to get people to, to remain here. Um, so yeah, so we, we, we saw um, a chilling effect and I think a lot of folks overseas, I personally heard it from others that they did not even wanna consider the United States anymore. I mean, if it takes you 10 years, for instance, as a professional to eventually obtain a green card in the United States, if you're from say India or China or um, the Philippines, um, and you have a quicker path somewhere else, you may consider that path uh, because, you know, of course, as many of them tend to be younger and uh, they have young families and, you know, it's a, it's a long commitment. So the uncertainty um, is, is not helpful whatsoever. And I think just being more welcoming to immigrants and changing the narrative and making immigration in general a positive thing, unfortunately, it's still a, a very divisive sort of word that um, you know, it, it where it, it, it makes it sound as if outsiders are coming in to take over and they need benefits and they're not contributing, they're just taking from the system. And it's the complete opposite. So I think that narrative under the previous administration hopefully is giving way now to more of a positive optimistic policy that's realistic and will make sure that the United States is at the forefront in technology and services. And also to alleviate the pressure on a lot of our employees and companies that simply um, are overburdened due to the pandemic and, um, and again, paying into our system. So I think with the Biden administration, they've tried to undo a lot of these things. Unfortunately, there were something like 400 plus policies that were changed. So it's a lot of work. Um, they pretty much have been able to get rid of a lot of the, um, the quick hits, if you will, and bring the, the system back to where it was, uh, where it's a pro- business, pro-knowledge worker system. Um, and, um, and so I, I know they're working hard to, to make it a smart system, but at the same time, they do have very strong safeguards for protecting U.S. workers, which is really critical as well. And I think Rami, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe under the prior administration, they, they went back to um, overseas requiring visa appointments for every or visa interviews for every applicant, which is something that had been done away under a prior administration. Um, although the Biden administration now appears to be reversing that again to going back to, you know, if you've had the same visa and you're applying for a renewal, you don't need an interview. And there's some other things too. Um, and, um, you know, it, it appeared to me that under the prior administration, there were just additional layers added into all the processes to make things more complicated and lengthy, which really obviously negatively impacted the immigration. Um, and as you mentioned, or started talking about, you know, President Biden during his first year. Um, I know recently there was a report out by the Migration Policy Institute about uh, the president's first year, and he's completed something like 296 immigration actions in his first year alone. A lot of them are small, 
small, but, um, you know, important um, nonetheless. And are there other um, accomplishments so far during the Biden administration that you would point to, um, especially around obviously the business immigration side that are starting to try and either make those positive changes or more efficiencies for processing? No, good point. I, even just like prior deference, if for instance, if someone was here on an H-1B and we're moving towards an extension, the government would basically give them the benefit of the doubt and uh, would more or less approve the case unless they find fraud or misrepresentation or something drastic, uh, significant error. Um, so that that lessened the burden on on corporations as well as individuals. And again, even our just our tax dollars and government, USCIS is more or less fee driven. But still, um, you know, we we have limited resources in the government and we have to focus on what's critical. So um, so that is one aspect is the prior. And then also to even just the um, once you apply for an adjustment of status for uh, permanent residency, um, requiring in some cases many more. Uh, in-person interviews, which again doesn't make a lot of sense. These people have been cleared; they've done the you know the background, police clearance, etc., um, and they're clearly well educated and are not going to be taking from the system. They'll be adding to the system. So again, just un- artificial obstacles just to make it very difficult. Uh, and then we, there is a whole slew of them, and we can get into more of them if you'd like. But um, clearly, the direction of the Biden administration is just more open, more transparent, more cooperative, more welcoming. And, uh, and just getting rid of some of these artificial barriers and obstacles uh, to facilitate corporations' ability to attract talent and to bring in the right people and to keep the right people here and uh, to be able to execute on their business strategy and develop greater technology, et cetera. Um, so um, I, I think when you make it so difficult, uh, when the executive branch makes the process uh, artificially arduous and difficult, it does um, send a chilling effect. And a lot of corporations will either not do as many uh, matters or seek as many foreign nationals, or they will may, maybe just move the entire sort of operation elsewhere. And that's, we don't want that. That's not against, uh, that's against our national interest and economic interest. For sure, for sure. Um, so in terms of some of the things that President Biden's accomplished this year, I know one thing that I think of, also to your point, Rami, it was a result of a lawsuit, um, whereas the H4L2 um, EAD and, and employment incident to status, um, you know, to try and help with some of those employment authorization card backlogs. And I think that's a really, that's a positive, but I also think there are, um, there's really a strong need then to educate employers on what that means and how that works, because I, I, I know it can be confusing that employment incident to status can be confusing for employers. So, whereas I think it's again, a positive that we have this new requirement for those, um, the employment for the H4 spouses and the L2 spouses. Right. Um, do you feel like employers are going to, this is my own, do you feel like the employers might need some educating on that piece, um, you know, to make it, so it's more user-friendly, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. Especially in, uh, in, in, in terms of this job market, if we can find eligible spouses that have the skill sets and the education and talent required, uh, sure, absolutely, why not? Um, I believe the administration also is trying to figure out and uh, come up with more definitive um, rules in terms of what, what occurs. But basically, um, L2s can immediately more or less be eligible. H4s, it opens it up for... for uh, um, easier facilitation of extensions of the EAD, et cetera. So there are some unique rules um, that um, the, the government or the, the, the USCIS and Homeland Security will issue. Um, and I think we should uh, actually take that to employers and, and discuss this possibility because this is a new avenue of talent that others um, that has opened up in the United States and especially during the pandemic and during our in this madness of the great resignation will allow a lot of corporations to seek and find um, the skill sets that they need. Yeah, and with the recent um, changes, uh, recent, I think it was as of last week, uh, that the Biden administration made around the STEM fields, um, there's a question about, do we, do we have any thoughts on how long it might take for universities to get their previously considered non-STEM degrees authorized in those new STEM categories? Interesting question. Um, this is relatively new, and um, I believe that uh, they've expanded it by, I think, 22, the STEM fields by 22 occupations or so. So um, I, I think that uh, we're probably going to have receive an announcement soon on how this is going to play out. But it does open up and makes, makes the entire O1 
category, much more liberal uh, for universities as well as for corporations to utilize uh, for talented workers that may not have made the, the H-1B quota. So I think that was a brilliant move on the Biden administration's part um, to, at least in the short term, it's not a, it's not a major um, um, significant numbers, I'm sure, that uh, we're going to be adding to the workforce, but it does offer some relief uh, to universities and highly educated individuals uh, in, in the STEM fields, and hopefully it, it, it spills over to other areas as well. Yeah. All right. Um, so Rami, looking in your magic ball, your crystal ball, what would you predict for 2022 and beyond in terms of business immigration? Oh boy. Well, um, unfortunately, if you want to make major changes, it has to be done legislatively. And so it has to pass the house, the Senate and be signed by the president. we as we discussed, uh, we don't really see that occurring. So I think, um, what's, what, what's transpiring now is just through executive orders or, uh, different interpretation. Um, we're seeing a more friendly um, administration that's trying to facilitate um, the ability of corporations to obtain talent or keep talent in the United States. Um, there are so many variables, um, Karen, as you know, immigration too is, is driven by economics as well as national security. There are so many um, geopolitical events that are occurring right now and um, unfortunately, depending on what happens with the pandemic, what happens between the United States and China, what's occurring right now between Russia and Ukraine, um, some of these policies uh, end up superseding Im immigration policy uh, and in fact, indirectly impacting it. So um, as the country, um, we'll have to adjust to the economic realities um, in the next few quarters. But um, I do know one thing that um, having additional talent more foreign workers that are highly educated in the United States will help uh, alleviate the, uh, the, the shortage of workers and will also uh, alleviate the rate of inflation and will help facilitate the growth of the economy, which is a good thing for everyone. But there's just so much that the Biden administration can do without um, the House and the Senate um, you know, passing significant and uh, very much needed uh, reform and modernization of our immigration system. Um, I do feel that um, there will be a little bit more in terms of uh, protection from the Department of Labor um, for US workers. But again, when you're looking at an unemployment rate of less than 4% that's declining every month, and some of these fields against less than 2%, I don't see a lot of abuse there. Um, but uh, of course, any abuse is unacceptable. So. Um, so the companies that do somehow uh, abuse the system should pay the penalty for it. Um, but um, again, I, I, I think the administration is coming up with some creative ways in terms of how to deal with uh, soliciting and keeping talent, such as the O1 expansion and uh, liberalization of the definition of what, what may transpire and qualify for it. Yeah, and I know there's some hope. Um... Right, I think with some of the expansion, especially under the national interest waiver, waiver category in 01 for um, immigrant entrepreneurs as well, right? I think that's a, an area that um, the administration's really hoping will be impacted by some of the changes that they're making. Um, you know, and I hopefully I, and I hear, we hear often from employers and from immigration attorneys at the state just about some of the cumbersome and burdensome processes. And I know I really hope that during um, you know, the next year or two under this administration, they can really look at some of the processes and challenges that were put in the way over the last few years and, and try and put some of those efficiencies back in and, and get a better handle on the processing times um, and allow employers to have a little bit more um, of a comfort level with the immigration process overall. I know that's been a struggle for a lot of employers dealing with all the uncertainty over the last you know, four or five years about processing and processing times. And some of that was pandemic related, but, but some of it was also um, due to, a, you know, changes, um, administ changes that the administration has made. Um, what it is kind of, you know, dovetails into the question we just asked, but what do you believe are the major political and economic developments that will affect or impact immigration this year? Um, well, as stated, uh, you know, a, a quickly declining and actually, um, an unexpected decline in the unemployment rate. Um, uh, the great resignation, a lot of people leaving the workforce uh, sooner than anticipated. Um, 
competition for talent overseas. All of these things will play into it. Uh, but I do want to touch upon one thing going back, uh, Karen. There's, uh, the USCIS are hard, very hardworking people. They're understaffed. Uh, I believe they have something like eight, 8 million uh, ongoing petitions and applications to deal with. Uh, that's very significant. Part of it, of course, um, was a result of the pandemic. Of course, we know what happened with Afghanistan um, and other things. So uh, they're doing the best they can. I know that frustrates a lot of people in the private sector. Um, but um, I think that they are slowly getting uh, things moving again and processing matters uh, in a much more efficient manner, hiring more people, expanding their staff. And I, same thing with the State Department as well. They've been very short staffed. Um, so, the, you know, the government workers also are really feeling the pinch on this and are extremely um, amazing for all of the uh, circumstances they've had to deal with in the last few years. But I, I think hopefully we'll start to see some of that uh, get cleaned up. I know that they're trying to modernize the system as well, hopefully make it eventually digital, et cetera. They're talking about the future to make it a more open, transparent um, system for employers and for individuals. Um, but to your question, what, may, what else may um, um, impact U.S. immigration? Um, hopefully, uh, we don't see any new variants that could create a, sh a slowdown in the economy. Um, obviously, a war in, in Eastern Europe would impact things. Um, a spike, unexpected spike in uh, the unemployment rate may, may impact things. Um, so there are a lot of variables out there. Um, that may impact um, the country's ability to, to better facilitate immigration. Um, but I think, again, under the, the new bill that was proposed, um, they do look at the unemployment rate in terms of the number of immigrants coming in. It's like an automatic trigger. So there's some very smart legislation out there that helps us immediately deal with circumstances that change very quickly in a world that's changing so quickly and is very unpredictable. So having those tools at hand would allow us to... Um, make the process more transparent and, uh, and allow co corporations to guide their employees through the process without the frustrations. Because again, it's, um, it's a very emotional process. Um, and for corporations that are extremely busy trying to execute, that's, an, that's another burden, unnecessary burden uh, that they need to take on, as well as the emotional burden uh, of the individual that's trying to seek employment in the United States. Um, so with all of this said, Karen, I, I, I just keep going back to it, looking at the individual as, you know, more of the power in the workforce is moving away from corporations to individuals, as we've seen with the Great Resignation. Um, if other countries are offering um, easier paths, more transparent and quicker paths, um, despite all the attraction of being in the United States um, and historically the number one destination, um, what will individuals eventually want to do? Um, that's the other thing that we have to think about is um, we have greater competition. And so um, as long as the economy stays strong, I, I think that there is hope that um, both parties will start to see the benefits of immigration. I don't know if that'll move towards greater legislation or passing a, some form of a bill, um, but it's something that um, has stalled and is really slowing down the country. It's a real anchor on the U.S. economy and on our progression in new fields and new technology. Yeah, um, and speaking of some of our, our uh, neighboring countries and, and immigration and their um, maybe more welcoming policies, we did have a question, and I'm trying to rack my brain going back to remember from when I did some Canadian um, immigration work, but are there financial requirements associated with the Canadian immigration process? Is there any sort of stated net worth for applying for the immigrant? I, I believe you have to show that you can, de you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really handle Canadian immigration. I just hear about the policy matters because our firm does handle uh, Canadian immigration. Um, no, normally they just look at the individual's education um, and uh, they do look at age um, and um, there's an uh, expectation that they will contribute and work. Um, but no, they don't have a lot of the rigors that we do. In fact, in Canada, if you need an IT worker, you can generally bring them over as quickly as two to three weeks compared to the United States. They don't have an artificial quota. Um, so Canada has been very pro-immigration. In fact, uh, during the previous administration, they were trying to, they were in the United States, uh, take, trying to uh, get foreign students in America to move over to their universities, get workers to move to, to Canada, um, uh, soliciting corporations, et cetera. Um, you know, for instance, Microsoft, of course, is Seattle-based, but they, for years, uh, over a decade, 
they have a very large office in Vancouver and tens of thousands of software developers there that they bring in from primarily India and Asia to, to Canada. Um, so the U.S. has lost out on tens of thousands of great paying jobs and God knows what emerging technologies that come from that. Um, and it's, uh, again, uh, if you look at uh, Germany or for instance, the UK, I think uh, the latest in the UK, and again, I'm not an expert here, is uh, if, as long as you're in IT, you pretty much can get in and get a visa. And this is post-Brexit. So we have a lot more competition. Uh, many countries have implemented smarter policies to attract the greatest talent. Because again, going back to the very beginning of this presentation, uh, we're looking at a 3.7 trillion just in the IT industry alone. Uh, with a six, five, six percent growth rate every year. Um, whatever country ultimately um, grabs the lion's share of that is going to do very well financially and it offers a lot of national security and economic security to the respective country um, and um, helps us rebuild our communities, uh, helps us add to our economy, generate tax revenues. Um, so again, I, I just don't see anything except for a bunch of positives. Uh, po you know, so I, um, I'm always a little uh, dumbfounded as to why we, we don't implement this, whether you're from the far right or far left, it just makes economic sense. And uh, I really hope that our course forward will be a, a much smarter policy to help us um, compete in a, in a world that's really seeking highly educated individuals, in particular IT, engineering, but also in healthcare and other areas as well. Yeah, yeah I know, Rami, you and I've had this conversation many times about the what we see as logical in terms of a U.S. immigration, a thoughtful U.S. immigration process that um, really kind of right lifts lifts all boats, so to speak, in terms of um, you know being able to um, having immigration also positively impact U.S. workers and wages and job creation, et cetera. I mean, there's just again lots we could go dive into in that topic. Um, the um, the another question that we got, and Steve, I'm actually going to bring you in on this question as well, um, is about uh, you know can we mention any corporate leaders or university presidents who may be champions for immigration reform? And Rami, I know you're part of a larger um, group, a uh, network of immigration attorneys and, and business leaders who talk about this work. And Steve, I know Global Detroit has worked closely um, with New American Economy on the Business Coalition Impact. Um, uh, um, um, pact um, for immigration. And so I wonder if either of you or both of you could take some time to comment on, you know, who we see as some of those corporate and university champions for immigration reform. Well, I'd love to hear from Steve. Steve. Uh, um, on a university level, you know, frankly, um, I don't have a great answer here. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, I, you know, that there, certainly the Michigan Association of State Universities um, has been a partner, but I don't think they've actually spoken up on, on legislative changes. You know, they're just quietly supportive of international students, um, but haven't really embraced like any exact programs to make it happen. But I know that um, I'm blanking at why am I blanking on the executive director's name, but they've been, you know, quietly supportive of, of, of various things around international students. Um, I also would say that on the national level, while there's groups like uh, the President's Council on, on, higher on immigrants and higher education, you know, they tend to focus more on undocumented students than they have on international students. And so um, this is a real issue, like when we talk about federal reform, that um, the issues that those of us who work with international students and try to connect them to the workplace, like that there really haven't been the kinds of national champions and partners for example, around international students that there have been around skilled immigrant integration around those who have come to the country and have a, uh, at least a four year degree and are underemployed and unemployed where there are a variety of national partners working on the issue. Um, in the corporate environment, um, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, so there is a, a mycompact.org and I'll put it in the chat uh, organization that um, launched right, uh, right before the uh, pandemic. And this was, um, launched with support um, from the New American Economy, but real leadership from the Grand Rapids Chamber in particular, but also the Detroit Regional Chamber uh, and Global Detroit. And there are about, um, I don't know, 15 or so important statewide uh, industry groups um, 
that um, I think the Michigan Chamber is even supportive um, that traditionally have identified, you know, with Republican candidates and and uh, Republican platforms. And so I do think it's a an important first step of getting those groups on record as supporting comprehensive immigration reform. Um, clearly, uh, I would say uh, the two groups, uh, the Grand Rapids Chamber, Detroit Chamber, um, Small Business Association of Michigan, and um, uh, Mish Auto in particular, those four have probably been the two most vocal in the state of Michigan. Um, and obviously there's a bunch of national groups that whether it's the New American Economy, the US Chamber, uh, the Business Roundtable, uh, then the kind of uh, groups that have more of a tech startup history like welcome.us uh, and others that have been pushing on the federal level. But we have, um, I think struggled, I mean, people are frustrated with the issue, right? And so struggled to get kind of your average group um, involved. Um, the thing that came out, you know, Karen and I were just on a call uh, with the Brookings Institution about the new um, various rules that came out on Friday. And uh, I think there's a, you know, there are going to create opportunities on how uh, more, obviously more majors can qualify for the three-year OPT, but also how uh, both in the startup community and the corporate community, people can access uh, some of these other, you know, under existing law. Uh, O-1 visas, EB-2 visas, et cetera, um, and clarifying rules around there and making that a much wider pipeline, you know, that moving those numbers from uh, some cases six or 8,000 a year um, and growing them more to 20 or 30,000. And that could be a real huge win, but it is only a win as much as the corporations and universities like embrace them and pursue them. And so um, I think, um, you know, uh, what I tried to express to the group is like, there's a group of us, I, you know, I see uh, Betsy Cohen and Lisa Stockberger and others on the call who, you know, are leaders in other communities across the Great Lakes region. Um, there's a there's a team of us eager to talk to our corporate partners and university partners about how to leverage these new opportunities, but we need to work in partnership. And, you know, right now, the immigration bar is very keen on these things and understands them. And, laps up the you know the press releases and the things that come out but translating that into the corporate hr context so that uh, corporations can understand like here's a pathway and we can utilize it is work that we all have to do together so with that i'll yeah, there's... After, uh, i'm sorry can i mention a gtri i believe steve that you played a big role with uh global talent retention initiative and uh many of the universities do have uh you know very strong international uh departments and are trying to do be proactive in placements and facilitating relationships with corporations and convincing them to pursue the immigration route. And again, going back to national policy, if we can make it more uh, transparent, efficient, et cetera, it helps that that initiative. But if it becomes very burdensome, then you know a lot of them will, will uh, be dissuaded from doing so. Sorry, Karen. I, I, you know. No, that's okay. And just um, a little bit more broadly to the uh, New American Economy, which is now part of the American Immigration Council, um, as Steve was mentioning about the Michigan Compact, um, New American Economy has launched a bunch of different business immigration compacts with other in other states. So Iowa and Utah and Colorado and Florida and Maine um, and others. Um, so if you want to hear more or see more, read more about um, some other um, leaders kind of in, from the business sector in this area, um, that's a good place to look is on the New American Economy website. And I'll drop that website link in the chat. Um, and then just in their search bar, if you just type in the word compact, it'll pull up the states that have different compacts on immigration and, and those are business immigration focused. So um, another good place to look for, um, you know, from a nationwide perspective, who are some of those um, business leaders in different states who really try and champion, um, champion the efforts. Um, so um, that was, so we are just getting close to time here and appreciate um, everyone's time and, and taking your, your lunch hour and spending the time with us. Um, um, sorry, I can't type at the same time. Um, I am going to turn it back to Quijo to close us out. Um, but again, really appreciate everyone taking the time and have to thank Rami for his insight and knowledge in this area. Uh, we've been chatted just before we started it. He's been working in this field for, for close to 30 years, and that definitely shows. And his passion for this work is definitely endless um, in terms of advocating for um, more responsible and reasonable immigration reform. So thanks so much, Rami. Um, you, and with Karen. that, I'll turn it over to you. We you know, I oh, did sorry, forget, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, I just forgot. Uh, oh, we have one minute. Um, 
We're also, you know, a major investment of recovery dollars into these topics, international student retention, et cetera, uh, is, is uh, being developed for the state legislature. Those who want to find out more about that certainly can reach out to me, so. Thank you, um, Karen and Ron, really for spending the past hour with us and sharing all the great insights, perspectives on the major immigrant policy changes um, in the past year and looking into the future. The past two years for immigrants has, you know, has been a real whirlwind as far as the policies are concerned. So this seminar is, like, is really informative and helped to, to put things in perspectives. And we also, um, as a strong advocate and a former international student myself, uh, we learned some really very promising news uh, for the international students um, and international born born uh, talents. So really, really appreciate um, you for that, sharing the good news. And so we will be sending the recording and the uh, PowerPoint presentation we prepared to everyone who registered for the event. Uh, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday afternoon. Thank you. Thanks to Global Detroit. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank, thank you so much, Ron. Right, thank you. Take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.